from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Sergeant Catherine Small from Charleston, West Virginia, 31 Bravo, Military Police. Uh, Staff Sergeant Matthew Watson from Warrington, West Virginia, uh, 31 Bravo, Military Police. I'm Specialist Jossie Davis from Bangor, Maine, 31 Bravo, Military Police. Mass Sergeant James Summer, Assistantville, West Virginia, 31B, Military Policeman. My name is First Lieutenant David Bauer from Gaithersburg, Maryland. I'm a 31 Alpha Military Police Officer. These are some of the soldiers of the 151 Military Police Battalion. I was embedded with the 151 in the late spring of 2010. I wanted to make a documentary about what American troops are now doing in Iraq, and the 151 let me into that world. This film isn't about horrific explosions and gun battles. Instead, it's about the critical challenge shouldered by American military police. Imagine this, they are attempting to create an entirely new police culture in Iraq. They're helping transform the Iraqi police from an organization that served a brutal regime to one that serves the people and the law. If eight years of war, over $700 billion, the sacrifices of thousands of lives, and the work of over a million Americans are going to have an enduring effect, then this last advise and assist mission must succeed. The Army is a hierarchical organization with command flowing from the top down. Each unit in the organization is identified by a number and a term representing the size of the unit. In the first six months of 2010, the U.S. Division Central commanded four brigades. One of those brigades was the 1st Brigade of the 82nd Airborne Division, consisting of about 5,000 soldiers in Anbar Province. The brigade was divided into six battalions. One of those battalions was the 151 Military Police. The battalion's duties typify police advising and training missions all over Iraq. The 151 was headquartered in this old Iraqi army building. Relax, relax. Thanks. Yes, sir. How are you doing today? Yes, sir. How are you? All right. Lieutenant Colonel Jim McHugh is the battalion's commander. The battalion's headquarters detachment is the West Virginia National Guard unit. In his civilian life, Colonel McHugh is the Jackson County, West Virginia prosecutor. We've spent years working on uh, talking about the importance of rule of law with the Iraqis, and it's important to them too. And they've got their justice system, which is different from ours, um, but it's effective. And um, the judges and the police, and it's the same way in America, they don't always communicate the best. The judges say, you know, if, if you don't have the evidence, the case is going to get thrown out. It's the same way back home. Brigadier General Michael Smith has been in charge of the American effort to advise and train the Iraqi police since the fall of 2009. I wanted to get the most recent big picture, so I interviewed him in March 2011. For the Iraqi police, the, the idea of the rule of law is that uh, they, they must abide by the constitution of Iraq and the laws of Iraq, and that uh, it's important to realize that no person is above the law. That's a cultural change for them, or a, a regime change, if you will, because that's not the way it was in the past. The police now have responsibility for protecting the people as opposed to protecting the leadership, protecting the regime. So when we say rule of law, that's um, 
uh, applying what we would call democratic policing principles and that Iraq is a democracy now. Lieutenant General James Dubik was in charge of Iraqi police advising and training in 2007 and 2008. He arrived when some of the police were operating as death squads during the sectarian violence. He helped the Iraqi Ministry of the Interior root out the bad police and establish better leadership and recruitment. He is now retired, but he stays current on Iraq while writing policy papers for the Institute for the Study of War. In March 2011, I asked him to talk about the stakes for the advising and training mission. The stakes is for, for them is to return to a society that they know they don't want. They don't want a repressive police. They want a police force that represents, that enforces the law relatively objectively for all sex. And uh, if we fail in the police development mode, they're, gonna, they're not going to get that. The stakes for the United States should be viewed at least in two ways. First, if we fail, we lose a strategic partner that is on the western border of Iran, and therefore very important. The other way to look at this is failure would be to have wasted thousands of lives, not just the lives killed, but the lives wounded and the families who have suffered so much to get us to where we are. Uh, I think as a nation, we owe it to all of those who have sacrificed to be as firm at the end of the war as we were in the middle of the war. And regardless of where one stands uh, with respect to the beginning of the Iraq war, we're at the end of it. And we can end it in a way that it's the best interest of our nation and the best interest of the Iraqi nation. Some of the battalion's military police are organized into police transition teams, which the Army abbreviates as PTT. Each team is assigned to work with an Iraqi district police headquarters. Today I'm traveling with PTT-7. They're from the Ohio National Guard's 585 Military Police Company. We're going to Habania, about an hour's drive from Camp Ramadi. I wrongly thought they might be relaxing their vigilance as Iraqis take over combat missions. But Iraq is definitely not the last bridge from Apocalypse Now. It is still dangerous for American troops to travel outside their bases, so they are always ready to defend themselves. The night before the trip, I spoke with the team leader, and asked him about the Habania police chief. Have you been working with this police chief for a while, just you and him? Is that um, essentially, no. We are now um, relieving the unit that's been doing it. Um, I've been out there just a handful of times myself now. Um, so they already had a good rapport built prior to my stepping in, um, and it's transitioned very well, and I, uh, I haven't had any problems with him. Basically, we go to Habania DHQ uh, a couple of times a week. When we go there, um, Myself and Sergeant Cutshaw and the medic specialist Weiner, we go to the training sections, the investigation section, uh, CTU, which is counterterrorism, and we go to the D-cell, which is the uh, detention facility. The soldiers are fully focused on their surroundings. When they made this drive the previous week, someone threw an armor-piercing bomb at their trucks. Luckily, it sailed over a hood without exploding. During the drive, we go right through downtown Ramadi. In 2006, the city saw some of the war's heaviest fighting. Now, large new homes are under construction in the suburbs. A lot of these young soldiers coming in, it's incumbent upon them to understand the culture, um, try to look at the problems through the lens of the culture of Iraq, and. Um, understand where the police chief is coming from when he explains his problems. Not always, we can't always put an American uh, solution to their problems. We have to apply Iraqi solutions. How is everything else going around here? As you know, three days ago, the incident, uh, the IED, you know, one of the Abu Jahash in Andalus area, uh, Thanks to God, there is no casualty. It is only damage in the property, on the house. Uh, they attack a uh, house of uh, one captain. He is uh, working in Andalus, Belandus, Abu Jahashwa, in Abu Jahash IP station. Uh, and that's it. Colonel B goes on to say that Al Qaeda members are now being released from prisons, including the former American prison at Camp Buka. He says they're seeking revenge on the police. One mission for a police transition team is to help the Iraqi police solve problems 
they can't solve by themselves. Colonel Bede explains that in 04 and 05, police in Habaniya were killing al-Qaeda members. The Iraqi Ministry of the Interior, or MOI, is investigating. Now the family of al-Qaeda members, now they claim that those IPs killed the al-Qaeda member not because they are from al-Qaeda, actually because of the tribe's problem and something like this. So let me get this right. MOI is just taking the word of these families and yeah, stuff exactly. that say, yeah. and then they're issuing out warrants and stuff to apprehend all these IPs. Colonel Beat says yes, and that his beliefs are not killing people because of tribal differences, but because they are al-Qaeda. He says now they are afraid to use force for fear they will be arrested later. You hope that you write this in your report? Yeah, absolutely. And to your chain of command, maybe maybe they can influence in that issue okay. in MOI or in Ambara province. Okay, yeah, I will for sure. Uh, one of the hallmarks of a professional organization is the ability for it to police itself and to enforce standards. So having an internal affairs uh, organization that does that, that goes out, investigates uh, allegations against its own forces, against its own policemen, is truly important uh, and, a, uh, and a necessary part of their development. We created that um, and got it moving pretty firmly in 2007. And initially, the Director of Internal Affairs at the ministerial level was subject to over a dozen assassination attempts. Uh, because he knew the importance of having an internal affairs arm and the importance of being aggressive in investigating. Sergeant Thomas Sheehan was the team leader for the Fallujah district, the next district to the east. He's sitting in on today's meeting in Habaniya. They have a lot of good leadership and a lot of younger leadership that looks very to be very promising in the future. So that's what we want to see and that is what we've been seeing as far as in our district of Fallujah. Well, there's a lot of older guys, but there's newer guys who don't have the same radical views as a lot of the old corrupt officers did. And those guys are going to be the ones who end up changing the country and leading it in a new direction, which is hopefully what all of this has been for. While the overall number of attacks on Iraqis continues to decline, Iraqi police and their families are still heavily targeted for assassinations and bombings. According to the internet site IraqBodyCount.org, over 2,000 police were killed at the height of the Civil War in 2007. Their deaths accounted for a small percentage of all Iraqi violent deaths that year. In 2010, half as many police were killed, but one in four of all killings in Iraq were Iraqi police officers. The Americans have taken off their helmets and body armor as a sign of respect to the Iraqis, but it is still dangerous in December 2010, an American soldier was killed by a sniper while he guarded a meeting between Americans and Iraqis. Some of the Americans are assigned to keep watch. I'm a Specialist Montgomery, 31 Bravo Military Police, and I'm a driver for uh, my company. What are you doing today? Today I'm pulling uh, security for our element while they conduct leader engagements, and then I will be a driver throughout the city to our return home. Upstairs, other American military police are meeting with the Iraqis who run the district jail, which they call the D-cell. Their main concern today is the health of the detainees. An American civilian prison expert is explaining how they could let detainees go outside more and how that would be good for the jail. We're going to enhance your security for the D-cell. That way, uh, when you have more re um, recreation time, we don't let anyone outside the, the D-cell. We'll, we'll also bring some sea wire. We need to make note uh, we need some sea wire. So we can have a, an isolated area so we could uh, detain or put them outside and they can get some sun, get some vitamin D in them, you know, keep them outside for a while. And then we're going to go over operations as far as security, uh, looking for contraband. Um, while they're doing their recreation time, that's when the D cell personnel will conduct um, security sweeps for contraband and or looking for hygiene issues, you know, whatever. <laughs> We have the, the, the time we keep the, the, the detainee outside at a sunny place, uh, but it's not more than an hour. 
We don't keep them outside more than an hour. We can change it to where it's, it's like maybe two hours, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. The Iraqi police point out it's too hot in the afternoon. And besides, they say, they are detainees. I understand that. But you also got to consider the health issues. Um, yes. The longer they stay in there confined, the more the spread of diseases will happen. These initial meetings can be awkward as the Americans and the Iraqis learn about each other. But the police transition teams have been effective. They were created in 2005 when 5,000 MPs began going to hundreds of police stations in Iraq on a daily basis. They policed side by side with the Iraqi police. General Smith credits the PTTs with reshaping the Iraqi police force. So you had U.S. military police and international police advisors, civilian cops, all across the country in their mentoring, training, advising, insisting at the, the smallest police station uh, in Iraq. Uh, truly remarkable effort, grassroots effort, uh, really given the attention and the, the training and improving the skills that was so essential and that really formed the building block for where we are now. Sergeant Canelli asked the interpreter to ask the captain if he or any of his police want to take a class. It's two weeks long. Two weeks long. Mm -hmm. What about that? What the subject? What they teach? D cell. D cell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He said maybe I will send Haitham or me to attend, to be like train for trainer for the future. Uh, just let us know where, when. Yeah. I'll get more information on it for the next time we come so we can let him know. Sergeant Cutshaw demonstrates how to collect a swab to detect explosive particles on suspects. On the subject, you're going to want the back of the hand, um, in between the thumb and the forefinger, really, really good, okay? And then the wrist, okay? You're going to set that back inside and then shut it. When they, when they come out for recreation, we'll deploy it all out here and then be a big square. And then maybe we can get some uh, on top of this See wire right on here. the top? Yeah. And then uh, we'll, we'll have a guard post or whatever. We could recommend where the guards need to be. And then this can be their whole area. And it needs to be swept up and cleaned up with any contraband or whatever. Of course. So they can see if there's any yeah. hidden weapons or whatever. After the meeting, we toured the detention facility. But I wasn't allowed to videotape. Most detainees were kept in several large rooms filled with their food, mats, and personal belongings. Three of the detainees were considered especially dangerous, and each was confined to a cell that was only about five feet by five feet. The MPs have a significant role in detention operations in Iraq as well, and have had from the beginning. They focus in on inspecting the detention facilities and detention operations to make sure that they comply with the rule of law, to make any on the spot corrections that are needed, and to really stress the importance of sending the corrections officers to training so that they know what right looks like and they know how to operate a detention facility in a de democratic society. When we returned to Camp Ramadi, I asked Staff Sergeant Coet what the chief talked about after I was asked to leave the meeting for security reasons. We were talking about a lot of the problems that they're having with their judicial systems and um, part of their investigations problems with not getting the proper evidence that they need to get these convictions. Um, they're having a lot of problems with judges releasing people that they know for a fact um, are guilty of some crimes. The judges that they have here, um, some of them are corrupt. Um, they will take bribes. I know that's part of the problem. Um, the other problems are that the only way that they will get their convictions is if someone actually had eyes on and saw them commit the crimes. It doesn't matter if there's a confession um, because they're saying that the ways of their interrogations might not be proper and they might be forced in these confessions. There wasn't always trust and confidence between the police and the judiciary. Uh, they tend to suspect each other. Uh, remember that the police are coming from a confessions-based system and they're now moving to an evidence-based system. That's a, a major change. That's also a change for the courts because the courts were based on a confessions-based system as well. So it's a significant paradigm shift for the courts to be looking for evidence and to establish the ground rules for the types of evidence that they're looking for, what standards uh, that evidence must meet, how it must be presented uh, in accordance with the rule of law. Reports from the police transition teams are passed to the 151 MP Battalion Headquarters Detachment. These soldiers are trained to manage the five military police companies, or about 800 MPs, that are assigned to the battalion. 
Like any large business, the HQ detachment is broken down into departments, which the Army calls shops. Major Teresa James from St. Albans, West Virginia. I'm a 31 Alpha military police officer. Major Teresa James is the battalion's executive officer. Her job is to make sure all the shops are working well with each other. We, as the staff, are making sure that the readiness level of all of our units is 100% so that they're fully mission capable. You know, if you don't have the people, um, then you can't, you know, support the mission. If your vehicle is broke, then you can't support the mission. First Lieutenant Matt Izzo from Cross Lanes, West Virginia, and I'm 31 Alpha Military Police. We get a report every morning uh, uh, by 9 a.m. as to where each one of the 923 soldiers is located. Sergeant Christy Bryson from Charleston, 31 Bravo Military Police and 42 Alpha Human Resources Specialist. Right now we're in the middle of processing awards for all of our subordinate companies. Um, just making sure that everybody else in the section is on top of the things they're supposed to be on top of. Um, personnel reporting. Um, anytime anybody gets injured or sick and gets medically evacuated out, we have to report that up through channels. As soon as we got here, we received orders to start preparing for the responsible drawdown of forces. So each one of the units at that time were able to you know, look at their property books and actually start saying, hey, what do we need now and how can we draw, start drawing back? Each one of the companies primarily have about 11 or 1200 pieces of non-rolling stock and approximately 60 rolling stock, the MRAPs and or M1151s. When the 151 MP battalion transitioned from Al Takatum Air Base to here at Camp Ramadi, we shut that base down. So we came here with a lot of containers like the ones that you see behind me here. We reclaimed from Al Takatum uh, fire extinguishers, reams of paper, routers, camera tripods, rope, a little bit of everything. What have we got in this one here? And you can see uh, like this uh, container has lots of gym equipment inside of it. Are we can put the monitors in the box? Uh, the monitors will be going in those oh, boxes okay. right there. My support section spent about, about the better part of three months sorting through it. Because, I mean, you're talking in excess of probably, you know, $100 million worth of equipment. You know, the mission wasn't exactly exciting. But, you know, when you really think about the, the payoff that you get, you know, being a taxpayer, you look at it and say, well, I at least salvaged that much of American taxpayer money. There's a lot of benefits uh, to the Guard. They, they bring a lot to the fight. Um, they uh, obviously have their civilian occupations that they can bring with them as well. We have several police officers and correctional officers, and uh, that helps with training the Iraqi police. And also our soldiers, by and large, are several years older than their contemporaries by rank. And uh, they bring a certain amount of maturity with them, and that helps as well. Let her fly. Let her fly. West Virginia is my home. I love the United States, of course. I love the red, white, and blue, but West Virginia is home. I'm a police officer. I work for the Division of Natural Resources. I did already had 20 years in and had actually thought about getting out and it's just my love for the, for the Guard and for the state of West Virginia is the reason I stayed in. The National Guard, the way it's, the way it's designed, we're, we're a close-knit organization. Uh, we watch out after each other. We're, we're really like a family. Attention to orders. Know ye that reposing special trust and faith in the professionalism, abilities, and patriotism of Samuel J. Goins III, I do hereby promote him to the rank of Staff Sergeant, to rank as such from the 21st day of May, 2010. Signed, Alan E. Tackett, Major General, the Adjutant General. Like right now, if I had problems at my house, I'm here in Iraq, it would be my guard friends back home that I would call. Uh, and I wouldn't have to call far 
to be able to find somebody that would go over and take care of my refrigerator was out or if my furnace went down or if my water pipe was busted or whatever, they, those guys would be there. Uh, we are, we're close. Memorial Day. Back home, my friends are going to our favorite swimming spot, grilling out and drinking beer. At Camp Ramadi, the soldiers did what they could to both remember the sacrifices of our military and to celebrate the holiday. Coffee drinkers? Yes. I am, I do not do anything in the morning without my coffee. I can't believe she sent me those sponsors. Thanks for coming in. Thank you very much. We've got green beans, vanilla, vanilla chai latte, latte here from Green Beans. Usually once a week, we do try to give the soldiers a day off because it helps them focus and uh, gives them a break. It doesn't always happen that way. It's all uh, dependent on the mission and the operational tempo. But um, we do try to give the soldiers a day off. The brown one, uh -huh. best chair in Iraq. Uh -huh. Period. <laughs> Went to the PX to get some uh, hamburger buns and hot dog buns to grill out. Makes it feel just a little bit like home over here. Specialist Brooks Johnson, Charleston, West Virginia, 88 Mike, motor transportation operator. My name is Azad. Azad. I'm from Bangladesh. I'm Specialist Chad Smith with the uh, West Virginia Army National Guard from Boone County and a 92 Fox Trout Petroleum Supply Specialist. <laughs> Thank you for this food, bless it to our bodies, and us to your glory, in Christ's name, amen. I'm Chaplain Gary Coffey, 151 MP Battalion from Winfield, West Virginia. I'm a 56 Alpha, which means I am a chaplain in the Army. Make sure the trucks are squared away, ready to go. Get the uh, two teams that are going out to the gate. I need to see you right after this. And then Staff Sergeant Eric Armstrong is giving orders to his soldiers from the 472 Military Police Company out of Fairbanks, Alaska. Today I'm over at the Ramadi Police Training Center as they prepare for a class. The requests for those classes came from meetings with district police chiefs, like the one I went to in Habaniya. The 151 headquarters then assigns an MP company to teach the class. They rehearse, they uh, get the materials that are necessary to teach the course, whether it be fingerprint kits um, or evidence collection kits, whatever uh, they need to teach the course. They'll track down the materials and uh, they'll plan it. They'll coordinate to get the students there. You know, we basically give them a general instruction to, to teach a course and they run with it from there.
On the way to the training center, I talked with the platoon leader about how they organized the classes. There's a much more strict hierarchy with the officers versus enlisted, and the officers pretty much run the show in the Iraqi police and the Iraqi army, whereas the Americans, we focus, we have a really strong uh, non-commissioned officer corps that is really the backbone of the army, uh, but that's not necessarily the, the, the same case with the Iraqi police. The units that we get will train everybody in there from your average uh, Sherta, which is their police, to uh, their NCOs that, that, you know, are their shift supervisors or whatever. We train them all uh, together so that they have that unit cohesiveness. The 472 teaches classes in controlling civil disturbances, and after an explosion killed two dozen Iraqis and seriously wounded the governor, the Iraqis requested a class on securing government officials. But when I was at the training center, the class was in crime scene investigation, and this class was being taught by an American civilian police partner. The 472 was providing security and support. Well, we have to make sure that the building is secure, that uh, the trainees are secure, and that's our job to assist with the training, is to make sure that we pull security. And you've been out checking on your guys? Yes, sir, constantly. They're doing good? They're doing great. It's a little hot, but other than that, they're pretty good, sir. It was a little hot, 117 degrees hot. Sergeant Tolbert's squad was out in the surrounding watchtowers. Today is the last day of class before tomorrow's final exam. Most of the Sherpas in the class are staying at the Ramadi Police Training Center for the two weeks of class. The officers arrive every day at the main gate. Only one officer shows up. It's Major Ahmed Faisal, the senior officer in the class. Everyone entering from outside the gate is searched by the Americans, even Major Faisal. After a while, they decide we're standing out in the open for too long, and someone could decide to take a shot at us from the buildings on the hill. We move. I apologize, for, you know, because there's officers with me, they didn't show up today, because they have... Well, I understand they that you guys are still working while you're doing this training, so I understand some days you're not going to be able to show up. The Army asked that I not show any of the faces of some of the interpreters. If it was found out they're working for the Americans, they could be in danger of reprisals. So I tried to keep them out of the shots. Major Faisal explains there was a raid last night, and the other officers are involved with processing the detainees. I understand. I understand. Okay. So hopefully everybody show up tomorrow and talk to Well, I hope so, or I'm going to fail everybody. <laughs> right. It's your job as police officers to enforce the rule of law in a democratic society. That is your job. Terry Glennon is the instructor. Like the Department of Defense contractor at the jail, he's part of the teams of U.S. military police and civilian police that are advising and training Iraqis all over the country. The civilian police share their knowledge of working with civilian judges, courts, and prisons. Remember what I said before, everybody lies, correct? Well, the judges are thinking you guys are lying. And so, so he's going to look at the evidence and say evidence is the only thing that doesn't lie. Major Faisal is joined by five SWAT team policemen who are also taking the class. These special weapons and tactics police carry out high-risk paramilitary police work, just like their counterparts in the U.S. In a democratic society, it is the police's job to prove it. The public, everybody, everybody has the right to say you are wrong, that you're the liars, not them. So you have to do the evidence correctly because the evidence doesn't lie. And when you pre prevent, present the evidence, you convict them. Things are difficult, right? Things are hard, right? All right, let's, let, we're going to go back to day one. We talked about why we're here. And I've said at the very beginning, 
Let me finish. Let me finish. And then let me finish and everything. You have to understand what has been asked of your country these last seven years to change from a police state to democratic policing. Very difficult thing for any for any country to accomplish. Nobody recognizes the amazing feat that they've accomplished here. It's just I I find it baffling that people think that uh, after a dictatorship is de decapitated, that people can turn on on, on, a, on a dime in another direction, and people expect it to be done overnight. This is a multi-generational task which is being accomplished. And the fact that I have some young students and some older students, and they're starting to understand, saying this is actually a good way we're going. Are there a lot of problems? Do they complain about the central government? Do they complain about their local government? Yes, they do, but then we do in America too. One of the SWAT police tells how they used to operate when they went on raids with the American Special Forces soldiers. He explains room searches and diagramming the crime scene and photographing the evidence. Then he says, if there are any suspects, they photograph them with the weapons. That's not correct. That's how the military does it, but that's not how police work do it. And you guys who do the raids and now are starting to process your own crime scenes. That's why the colonel wants you in here to get this training because all his cases are getting thrown out of court because you guys destroy the evidence. When you find all those weapons in the room and you pick them up, and put them in line, you've just destroyed evidence. And then you take the suspect from outside and you bring him back inside to the crime scene, you just destroyed more evidence. And the suspect's gonna tell the judge, they just grabbed me off the street, drugged me in there, put my hand on all the weapons, and then took a picture in front of it. The judge will throw the case out. And what's our number one job as police officers? What's our number one job? What are we supposed to do? Put the criminal in jail. Right. And if the case gets thrown out, that means we haven't done our job. They understand no longer is the suspect when he's arrested automatically guilty and open to torture. We, talk, we stress the ethics and the human rights aspect of this extensively. And they have to understand no longer just because they, they get something out of that man's mouth that that's going to convict them. And so they're criminals are being released because the judges say you're not following the rule of law. We don't care if you have a, just a confession anymore. You need to show us the evidence. And so the fact, again, that they're here is a huge step forward. After the class, we took the major and two of the interpreters to the gate. Tomorrow would be their final exam, a mock crime scene with two murder victims. The Iraqi media was coming to cover it, and I was thinking that will make it even more realistic. Life at Camp Ramadi is, of course, different than in the States. But in some ways, it's the same. I don't know, I, I like to drive places. It's the only feeling of, uh, of normalcy you get sometimes. You know, it's, you get in a vehicle, you're by yourself, you know, you run the AC. It's, uh, I don't know, it's, it's comforting in a way. Specialist Jason Huffman from Mill Creek, West Virginia. I'm in the 472nd MP Company out of Fort Wainwright, Alaska, but I'm still from West Virginia. Sergeant Jessica Maris, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 92 Alpha, Logistical Specialist. Specialist Andrew Vernon from Shinsta, West Virginia, 31 Bravo, Military Policeman. You have mail. Thank you. Sergeant Mike Ebert uh, from Wheeling, West Virginia. Uh, 31 Bravo, MP. First Lieutenant Dallas Wolf, Philippi, West Virginia, 31 Alpha, Military Police. A little bit of enchilada, some french fries. Been how, how is it? It's, uh, it's average. Black flag means uh, heat category five. Uh, heat category five means it's uh, it's about 120 degrees here, and it's a um, it's a combination of uh, heat plus humidity. And what that means is uh, your soldiers are only allowed to work 
for 15 minutes on at a time and you get 45 minutes of rest. You gotta closely monitor their uh, water consumption and it's uh, just dangerous levels of heat for a human body to be out in. Wow, that steering wheel's hot. I bet it is. Gosh, that's hot. Ooh, that shift knob's not any cooler. I'm Sergeant Gary Rice from Kaiser, West Virginia, and I'm a 31 Echo Interment and Relocation NCO. These are pictures of my daughters, and that's my oldest daughter who turned a year old right before I deployed the first time. So this is her second deployment with Daddy gone. And that's my middle daughter who was born about 10 months after I came off deployment in 04. This is my uh, newest daughter. She's six months old. She was born when I was on leave in November. <laughs> Specialist Daniel Parker, Philippi, West Virginia. 92 Golf Food Service Specialist, 31 Bravo, Military Police. He will my shield and portion me. It's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Staff Sergeant David Hunter. I'm originally from Clay County. I live in Roan County now. I am a 91 Bravo mechanic. Each unit's got their tools and we can analyze the problem. If we can change, if we got the parts in stock, we'll put them on. If not, we have to order them, let them and we have to wait till they come in. Waiting on parts is, is pretty tough over here because it's usually, it takes a little while. This is where we live. It's not much, but hey, we make do. It's the morning of the final exam for the crime scene investigation class for Iraqi police at the Ramadi Training Center. The soldiers, as always, prepare for trouble. Sergeant Tolbert is driving me out to the gate with the team that will pick up the Iraqi officers. Three officers arrive with Major Faisal. I asked the Major if he had taken other classes from the Americans. Major Faisal leads the planning session before the mock crime scene investigation begins. <laughs> Terry and Staff Sergeant Armstrong prepare two MPs to play the victims. What happened to you is your, your cur they took a machete and chopped your carotid artery and you bled out right here is basically what they're gonna, we're going to do. Good use of ketchup here. I'm going to put this as a blood splatter on, on the back. This is right, basically he's shot right here. Blood pattern here. And then uh, this may get in your head. Of course it runs down a little bit. Now you just slide over just like that, we'll get a cover for your head. Basically, that's what we want, right there. Christ. <laughs> so what we're looking for is the pattern. They should be able to see where the head was when it was. Now, this is a carotid bleed out. There's going to be a hell of a lot more blood on a carotid bleed out. He's going to pump for at least 30 to 40 seconds before his heart stops. Terry briefed the IPs on the situation. A witness was walking by and looked in and saw two bodies on the ground. They called the police. 
okay, you got the call that something had happened and you're responding to the area, to the crime scene. You're the first people who are going to get there. What are you going to do? The first people who are going to get there, what are you going to do? We're going to go to the Staff Sergeant Armstrong plays the witness, and the IP asks if he heard anything. Terry tells the Iraqi police that any American soldiers who aren't wearing a hat are part of the scenario. Then he arranges for two soldiers to have a surprise roll. And you're going to do your best. You know, you just, you got to think in your mind, your brothers are on that floor in there. You want to get to them. Okay? That's what you need. I mean, don't get violent, don't get physical, obviously. When the police say something, you do something. Gotcha? Don't turn this into a, a pushing match, all right? Okay, we're going to walk outside, and then from there, that scenario for the rest of you is going to begin. The press is waiting outside. Both NPR and Al Jazeera are here. The shirters have interviewed witnesses and sealed off the crime scene. Now the investigation officers pretend they are just arriving. When you approach the door, when you approach the front door, you, you understand that it looked like the door was pushed open to break it open. Okay. All right? Okay. Good luck, sir. Yes, please. The captain discovers a pistol under the stairs. If, Albert, to the investigators, if it's on the ground, it is evidence. Attention to detail. The U.S. military police took over advising and training the Iraqi police in 2004 when a surge of violence made it too dangerous for American State Department trainers. We trained uh, literally tens of thousands of Iraqi enlisted policemen in how to survive in a combat zone, which is what it was at that time, but also how to participate and help restore law and order, working initially with U.S. forces and then increasingly with their own leadership. When they finally did recognize those two people who came in were part of the scenario, yeah. they did good. They got them outside, they separated them, and they started interview. They yeah. did very good. Police training was increased from two weeks to ten, and Iraqis were learning how to teach the classes. By August 2007, over 164,000 police had been trained. But because of corruption and violence, only about half the force was actually working. Lieutenant General Dubik took over command of the advising and training of Iraqi army and police that summer. He credits Minister of the Interior Jawad al-Balani with turning around the police force. Following the counteroffensive in the hold and build phases, the Minister of Interior, with a lot of help from the coalition forces, took each community, one after the other, revetted the police, took all their names, who's really a policeman, who's really not, those who are really policemen, which ones have been performing, which ones haven't, vetted everybody, recruited to some national standards, but then set in place at each province a way to keep training. So he set in motion a set of processes and institutions and policies that over time, if followed, will slowly increase the pro professionalism of the police, which is what you see today. That's perfectly correct. You know, every, there's different ways to do it. If that's the way you do it, you just do it that way every time. That's perfectly good. There are now over 300,000 Iraqi police, a five-fold increase since the war began. There are 18 training centers where all the classes are taught by Iraqis. Americans are still teaching the critically important classes on forensics, counter-explosives, and criminal investigations, which is the class I'm at today. 
ودان ودان اخوان شباب good job gentlemen wake up there mister wake up get up get out of here you're done all right okay as i told you earlier today there were two fail points if you didn't hit them you were going to fail and the first one is was when we talked through the scenario if you did not pull out of the crime scene after the initial entry you failed when you explain initial entry to crime scene to me, it was very good. It was very detailed, exactly what I wanted to hear. The second, sell, second fail point was attention to detail as far as the evidence. There was one piece of evidence. If you did not collect, you would have failed, and this is it. Okay, now why was this piece of paper so important? Does anybody know? Did anybody look at it? They didn't read it, but they collected it. I mean, okay. but supposed to read it. But when he goes back to the station, when they look at the evidence, go ahead and open it. لما تروح المركز الشرطة وتفتحها وأقرأها شو شرح تلقيها؟ Right. This is a list of names. They could be murder. They could be the next exactly. step to the terrorism. Right. Or to we the don't know right criminal. now. Exactly. We don't know right now. Further investigation down the road when you get. Find out who all these people are. Are there any of the dead ones? What's our number one job as police officers? شنو الشغلة أو المهمة الأولى لضابط الشرطة؟ هو اعتقال المجرم وإداحة توقيف. Put the criminals behind the bar. That's right. That's our number one job. When we put the criminals behind the bars, it's how we protect society. It's how we enforce the rule of law. We put the criminals in jail. And what do I say about people? When somebody opens their mouth, what they're doing? They're lying. So what's the only thing that does not lie? The evidence. The evidence. The evidence is what will put him in jail. And what's our strongest weapon that we use to do this? The brain. Use your brain. Solve the problems. That's what it means to be a police officer. You solve problems. You guys should be proud of yourself. You did an outstanding job today. Have a good lunch. We would thank you, and it is your credit only. No, I appreciate it, sir. In general, the establishment of an evidence-based police system, an evidence-based judiciary, is nascent. It's not complete yet. The forensics that uh, we are used to here in the United States now do not exist in Iraq. The Iraqi Ministry of Interior and Minister of Justice know what they want to produce, but it will be years before the right forensics labs are established, the right habits of presenting evidence in court exist, and the right policing capabilities for collecting and preserving evidence uh, and, just, and uh, transfer of that evidence occurs. We're on our way to what used to be a huge American base at Camp al Qaeda. The 151 turned it over to the government of Iraq in January 2010. It was part of the process of turning over almost 500 bases before American troops leave. We wanted to see what the Iraqis are doing with the place. The Army, the Iraqi Air Force probably utilized whatever they saw fit there, generators, housing units, whatever was left behind. Uh, once they pick through it, that's probably about it. Akuwajawiya, which means in Arabic it's the Air Force right here. Oh, okay. Akuwajawiya. And as you do can see... Do they have planes here? They do. They have uh, some uh, Mi-17s, which are uh, Soviet-made helicopters. And uh, they're getting their uh, Air Force uh, going again. Uh, well, right here, where we're at now is where our, uh, our battalion used to be. Um, <clears throat> this used to be our old, uh, basically our compound. Um, we spent a solid four months here, four or five months. And uh, this is where daily operations were. Came here to work every morning. and. Uh, where the magic happens, so to speak. In the late spring of 2011, 
5,000 military police and their American civilian partners will still be in Iraq. 350 State Department employees will take over their job on October 1st. The State Department will only be advising at the highest levels of the Iraqi Ministry of the Interior. At the district and neighborhood level, the Iraqi police will be on their own. I asked General Smith and Dubik if the mission of transforming the Iraqi police will succeed. They're at the budding portion of creating a democratic, community-based, rule of law police force. There's always a risk that the path they're on could be derailed. And uh, that's why, for me, I'm not optimistic, I'm not pessimistic, I'm happy where we are, but uh, I also know that there's a lot of work left to be done. Success can be measured in, in several different ways. I, I look at success as the ability of the Iraqi police forces to conduct law enforcement operations in accordance with the Iraqi rule of law. That you have a police force that's uh, committed to protecting the people of Iraq and are committed to the future of the nation. I think our chances of success are very good. The work that's been done over the last uh, seven, eight years has really set a great foundation for the Iraqis. I don't know what will happen in Iraq. Will the Iraqis learn to share power between different ethnic and sectarian groups? Will they develop a relatively healthy economy? Will they even be able to provide electricity and other basic services? And if these things don't happen soon enough, will the country descend into renewed violence? I don't know, but United States military police and their civilian police partners have sacrificed lives and worked together for eight years to get the Iraqi police to the point where they will serve the rule of law. If they do that, then Iraq might maintain its fragile democracy, but that is up to the Iraqis. Stand at peace. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting, 